Hey everybody, Mr. J here. Today we are going to be going through the brain and the spinal cord, both structurally as well as functionally, okay? So the previous lecture that I posted would go over the overview of every part of the nervous system, both central and peripheral, where in this case, we're gonna be specifically talking about the central nervous system, which is literally the center of your body, your brain, and your spinal cord. So we're gonna go through the structures as well as how we can integrate some of their functions, all right? So first off, working outside in, we're going to talk a little bit about the meninges, both of the spinal cord, which are on the outside of the spinal cord, and then the brain, which is kind of more a deep part of the brain. And we'll see that in some diagrams. The way you can remember the three meninges, these are basically the linings of the brain and spinal cord, okay, is dura, arachnoid, and pia or pia mat. I'm, I'm not sure how everybody says it. Um, but I always remember that sometimes you might have to get a spinal dap or spinal tap, okay, if you have meningitis, to test for meningitis. So I always remember DAP, DAP, and that's how you go from basically um, superficial to deep with these layers. So let me show you what that looks like, uh, specifically in the spinal cord. So on the outer part is the dura matter. Working in is the subarachnoid space, so the arachnoid uh, matter, right, uh, right, it, uh, deep to it. And then you've got the pia matter, even more deep to that. So these are the three linings. And the goal of these linings primarily is to protect, right? Because this is a very important structure that we need to keep safe, as well as to nourish and moisturize the insides, the, the lining basically of the brain and the spinal cord. So in this subarachnoid space, you can see a lot of fluid. Okay, this is gonna be called cerebrospinal fluid. This is going to help nourish the brain um, because the brain and spinal cord, uh, both brain and spinal cord nourishes both. It's a very protected uh, tissue type, right? A lot of important neurons, a lot of important functions. So we actually have what's called the blood-brain barrier that prevents certain things of the blood to get into the brain because it might be damaging. So we almost have this extra uh, nutritional source in a way um, of this cerebrospinal fluid, once again, found in the subarachnoid space, all right? Uh, I'm not really gonna talk about meninges all that much, um, but again, a couple connections clinically. Um, you've probably heard of meningitis, which is the inflammation of me the meninges. This can be either viral or bacterial, really dangerous infection um, that you'll have to get a spinal tap for to test for. Very painful process. My wife actually had that done, and she said it was the worst experience of her life. Um, as well as you may have heard of epidurals before, epidurals. Okay, so this is when you're pregnant, and right before you give birth, you want to get an injection in your spinal cord that'll basically numb you from right above the waist down so you don't feel any pain during the the actual delivery and prior to delivery. Now, what's happening is they're actually putting an injection of a type of opioid that basically gets into this region of the dura matter and everything inferior to this, hopefully inferior to this, it'll basically diffuse down and cover all of those spinal nerves, all the sensory neurons that are coming in. So you won't feel any sensation from that point down. So that's an epidural. Now, let's talk about the spinal cord. So this is the spinal cord. It runs in your vertebral cavity, so it's protected by your vertebrae. You've got these little holes in your vertebrae um, that you see here. Okay, so here's the bone of the vertebrae, and you'll have a space inside of it. This is a foramen, so a hole, and this is where the spinal cord will run, all right? Um, there will be several structures of the spinal cord that I want you to remember, and these are uh, important uh, both functionally as well as structurally. So if you look at this, we've got kind of a gray and a white segment of the spinal cord itself. But before, let's get our bearings. This is anterior. If we're looking at this diagram, this would be anterior. So this is a person facing you in a way. You're looking into their spinal cord. This would be posterior on their backside, essentially. Okay. You can see two types of matter here. You can see the gray matter as well as the white matter. Now, the, the thing that makes the difference is uh, oh gosh, myelin, myelin, I almost said the wrong protein. So remember in the last uh, video, I talked about myelin, okay? And if neurons, remember spinal cord brain is made of neurons, right? If they are myelinated, they will appear white. And if you remember, these signals are going to be sent very fast because they're myelinated and the signal will basically hop, uh, saltatory conduction, jump, 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 all the way to where it needs to send the signal. So these are gonna be faster Okay, faster signals. Whereas if it's gray, it's going to be what's called unmyelinated. So no myelin, okay? Or very little myelin. All right, and these signals are going to be slower. 
All right, so if we think about it, the gray matter, we're gonna have some neurons that are gonna maybe communicate slower. Whereas in the white matter, we're going to travel a distance in the white matter. So we need them to be myelinated. We need to send the signal a long way. So we're gonna speed up their conduction. All right, so this will make sense here in a second, trust me. So a uh, couple of things here. Um, terminology wise, you got anterior horn, lateral horn, and posterior horn of the gray matter. Okay. And then in the other ones, I'm really not going to talk about, um, I'm just going to say the posterior part or the anterior part of the spinal cord. Okay. So here's a great diagram of a sensory neuron coming in. So let's say you get a, a hairbrush. Okay. So a spider's walking on your arm, right? Well, what will happen is those sensory neurons will send a signal towards the central nervous system because it's sensory. It's going to send it into the spinal cord, okay? So this is a spinal nerve here we'll talk about in a second. Sends that information into the gray matter. Gray matter, remember, is going to have slower moving neurons because they're gonna be really close connections. So at this point, there's going to be an interneuron that's communicating that will actually cross over and eventually get into the white matter. So now this part of it is going to be myelinated. Why does it need to be myelinated? Well, it's gonna speed up the signal, right? It's going to speed up the signal because it's got a long way to travel up to the brain, up to specifically the thalamus, which is the sorting center of the brain we'll talk about in a second. So the reason it's white matter that's sending the signal all the way up to the brain for you to actually experience that sensation um, is because it needs to send the signal fast. It needs to be myelinated, okay? So the gray matter, remember this, it's going to be small interneurons in the gray matter both in the brain and the spinal cord. And in the white matter, it's going to be long distance communication because it's myelinated. It's going to speed up the signal. Uh, it's similar to like, uh, think about gray matter being like residential roads, slow moving cars, whereas the white matter is the highways. All right. And think of the spinal cord as kind of an elevator up and you can also come back down from the brain. We'll talk about that in a second. So this is sensory integration of the spinal cord and the brain, whereas this is the motor effect from the brain through the spinal cord to an effector tissue. Now watch this. It'll originate in what's called the motor cortex. So you're gonna move something. You're gonna move a muscle specifically. Neurons in the gray matter will stimulate neurons to then jump into the white matter. So there will be another neuron that travels down the white matter, okay? Because we're speeding this up, we wanna happen fast. That signal will originate in your motor cortex, send signals down, 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 down. The descending tracks, these were ascending tracks, they're going upward. The descending tracks all the way down, they're going to cross over at the medulla. That's a cool thing called decussation. So uh, if you've ever heard like the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body, this is why. When they get to the, uh, basically the base of your brain stem, these neurons will hop over to the other side in the white matter, all right? And then they're going to hop into the gray matter, integrate that information, talk to a motor neuron that will then send a signal all the way to the skeletal muscle. That's what's going to move it. So this is a fascinating process for me to do this. There are signals originating in my motor cortex up here, going down my spinal cord, crossing over at the medulla, which is about here. Okay, crossing over to the medulla, going to the other side of my body, all the way down, communicating into the gray matter of the spinal cord, going out through a motor neuron, and then talking to the skeletal muscle. A lot of things happening. Why does it happen so fast? It's in the white matter. This long distance signal goes really fast through the white matter. All right. So let's talk about the brain. Hopefully that previous one made sense. I have another video about the spinal cord integration, ascending, descending tracks that you should watch um, that will really help you understand that. Now the brain is very, very complex. 100 billion neurons in your brain alone, and all of those can connect to other millions of neurons. So you've got trillions and trillions of connections within your brain. Absolutely fascinating. This is a marvel uh, to study, honestly. There are four main parts that I'm going to break up. There's going to be the cerebrum. This is the one you usually think of when you think of brain. And then you got three other parts, the diencephalon, cerebellum, and the brainstem. What I'm going to do is kind of point out the main structures here in a mid-sagittal section. And then I'm going to talk about what they do in this uh, diagram. So let's ro roll through uh, this mid-sagittal section. So when I say cerebrum, I'm thinking this main sort of gyrus sulcus section that you think of with the brain. Okay, gyrus means outcropping, sulcus means incropping. Okay, so the gyrus is any sort of uh, outward uh, structure, whereas the sulcus is basically a deep uh, depression, all right, within the brain. Uh, or wrinkle per se. 
um, as you move down, you've got the diencephalon, which will have a few different structures we'll talk about, the thalamus, hypothalamus, pineal, uh, posterior pituitary, and then you've got your brain stem, which will be your midbrain, your pons, and then your medulla. Then you've got your cerebellum, the little mushroom guy. I always remember it looks like a portabella mushroom bellum. Um, so this is going to be the cerebellum. All right, those are the four main parts. So let's talk about the different uh, sections of each one. All right, so let's start with the cerebrum. So that's the big guy that's going to be doing most of the work when you're thinking about the brain, uh, processing, sensation, all that stuff. In the frontal lobes, the uh, bolded part here, the frontal lobe of the um, cerebrum, this is going to deal with a lot of personality, decision making, what makes you, you, higher level thinking, all happens in the frontal lobe. You may have heard of your prefrontal cortex. So before the frontal cortex right in here, that's going to deal with a lot of your higher level thinking. This right here is going to be your primary motor cortex, still a part of the frontal lobe, and it's going to allow you to move skeletal muscles actively. So when I said primary motor cortex originates this, that is what I'm referring to now. That motor cortex of the cerebrum is right here. Now, that's uh, primarily the stuff I want you to remember the frontal lobe. Uh, there will also be Broca's area. This is uh, where you're going to generate action potentials and neurons that deal with speech production. So they'll originate here for speech, go to the primary motor cortex, and then go down to basically your tongue and your neck, mouth, all that stuff for, for you to speak. Then as we move posterior, you've got your parietal lobe. Most of this is going to deal with sensations, generalized sensations. Uh, in fact, right here is called the primary somatosensory cortex. This is going to be all your hot, cold, pain, pressure, touch. All that is experienced here. Um, and then in your temporal lobe, there's going to be a couple things here. So this is near your temporal bone. In fact, all of these lobes deal with different parts of the bones of the skull. Uh, so it's easy to remember. So this is the parietal lobe dealing with like sensory integration. Um, here, this is the temporal lobe. Remember M. I remember temporal lobe. First off, it's right next to your ear. Okay, here's your temporal bone. It's right next to your ear. So it deals with hearing. It's got an M, deals with memory. And it's going to also got an M, smell, memory, smell, hearing, all dealing in the temporal lobe. Also on the left side of the brain, only on the left side is Wernicke's area. Okay, Wernicke's area is going to be a speech understanding and making a comp making competent forms of speech. Okay, uh, so if uh, this area is working well, you'll be able to process auditory speech well, understand it, and then know what to say back, essentially. All right, work your way back, occipital lobe. O kind of looks like an eyeball because this is where you're going to see. This is your visual integration, all right? Um, so this is mostly uh, optic nerve from your eyes are going to talk to this occipital lobe. You'll make sense of it. So that's all the cerebrum, the main parts of the cerebrum. One other part I'll mention is the insula, which is right underneath that frontal lobe. If you pulled it back, this is going to be an association area. So think about uh, PTSD. So if you hear fireworks, you remember like a bomb you saw in Afghanistan. That is an insula reaction where your insula has uh, kind of tagged a loud boom as dangerous and stressful. And now anytime you hear any other loud boom, you you basically feel that same exact experience that you did in your uh, previous past. Same thing with like taste. If you have, if you were like sick and you were eating food and then you puked, then you kind of tag that food as like, oh, this is nasty. So then you eat the food again when you're healthy six months later and you're like, oh, I do not like this. That's because the insula has associated that with puke, which with disgusting, right? Now, that's all the parts of the cerebrum. Uh, cerebellum is going to primarily deal with uh, proprioception, so where your body is in space, as well as balance and coordination, all right? So this is a really important part, keeping your head so if you're tilted forward, you don't fall over. That's because you're cerebellum. And then you've got the brainstem hiding the uh, diencephalon uh, above it, as well as the main parts of the brainstem. So let me talk about the diencephalon. The thalamus is a little more superior, right in the center of the brain. All right. And this is going to be the sorting center. So it's going to basically receive a bunch of integration and tell where to send it in the brain to make sense of it. 
Um, the hypothalamus is the main regulator for your endocrine system. So it's going to have the pituitary right underneath it too. This is the pituitary right here, and it can kind of moderate different hormones getting dumped into the bloodstream. Pineal gland is going to deal more with sleep-wake cycle, um, and that's all part of the diencephalon. So we're dealing a little more with really important uh, homeostatic mechanisms like sleep, like uh, growth, like all these other things. Uh, I didn't mention the corpus callosum. This is kind of a bridge between the hemispheres of the brain, between uh, the left and the right hemisphere. So these are the connection points. Uh, so it's going to cross over, go to both sides, uh, connect those two hemispheres of the cerebrum. And then you got your brain stem. What I want you to remember from brain stem, so this is your midbrain, your pons, and your medulla. This is all part of the brain stem. Autonomic, uh, or not autonomic, I shouldn't say that. I should say automatic, very important life functions. Okay, breathing, keeping the heart beating properly, um, keeping uh, blood pressure, keeping the tone of your blood vessels, all of these really, really important things that if they go off, you're going to die, they're going to be conducted by your brainstem. Okay, so that is most of the stuff actually that I wanted to go through with the brain. Um, everything that you click through here uh, is really going to talk about what I just uh, talked about with those diagrams. A um, couple cool things. You've probably heard that one side of your brain is dominant over the other. Most people have a left side dominant because your left side controls the right side. And most people are right handed, right footed, uh, right dominant. Um, but some people are right hemisphere dominant. That usually means sometimes that they control. Uh, well, the right side is a little more creative, you may have heard. And your left side uh, hand and uh, leg, if you're left handed, maybe you're a little more creative person, right? Um, now, the reason it happens that way uh, is because the... I don't want to confuse you, but what happens is if you're moving your left arm, okay, I think this is flipped, so it's going to look a little weird on your screen. If you're moving your left arm, your right brain is starting that, is starting that motion, is starting that action potentials to make that motion happen. The reason for it is because when those action potentials are sent down your neurons, they cross over at your brain stem, okay? They cross over, travel down, and then talk to the uh, muscles of this arm. Same thing on the other side. Whereas if you experience pain, so I'm hitting my right arm, I'm going to interpret that on the left side of my brain. Why? When, well, I'll show it actually, when you get touched on one side, we already saw this. So say this is the, uh, I don't know, left side of your body. When it goes into the spinal cord, you see how it hops over to the right and then eventually ends up in the right side of the brain. That's because it's a crossing over at the level of the spinal cord, and then it's being interpreted by that side of the brain. So it's kind of interesting. So think about it. If you had a brain damage, maybe in the motor cortex of one side of your brain, so say you got damage on the left side of your brain, the right side of your body may be paralyzed, right? So that's just a cool little connection there. Um, other things, we talked a little bit about the... Uh, uh, Cerebrospinal fluid, uh, this can get uh, diffused into these ventricles, which nourishes the brain. I won't talk about them all that much, uh, but this is how it will move. Uh, so again, uh, subarachnoid space has all that cerebrospinal fluid. There will be several ventricles that nourish different parts of the brain, and it'll travel sort of in this anterior to posterior loop um, in the different ventricles. Talked about the thalamus being the sorter, hypothalamus, talking about homeostasis, regulating a whole bunch of things. Uh, limbic system is also a part of it in the diencephalon, so uh, kind of uh, near the thalamus, near the hypothalamus, and that's going to deal with emotional experiences. Uh, so that's why, I say, uh, if you, I don't know, experience some sort of stressful event, it can make you really emotional uh, because it's usually stimulating this like, ah, response, and that's usually starting within the limbic system. Um, and that can also be both uh, anger and fear, but also pleasure, uh, interestingly enough. Talked about the brain stem. I'm not going to go through those as much. Um, and then I want to go through briefly the cranial nerves as well as the autonomic nervous system. So cranial nerves originate in the brain, whereas the spinal cord nerves originate in the spinal cord and they branch off the spinal cord. And there's going to be 10 different cranial nerves. The way you can remember them is uh, by a certain mnemonic, and I'll tell you what that is. O, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet are heaven. Those are the 12 cranial nerves. I think I said 10. That's my bad. 12 cranial nerves. Um, and they are going to either be a sensory aspect. So they're going to be receiving sensory information or they're going to be a motor aspect. So they're sending information out or they can be both. So to remember that, you can remember some say marry, money, but my 
brother says big brains matter most. All right. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter most. So that's how I remember uh, what the names are. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm not going to go through the functions. But if you remember that mnemonic uh, for both of them, you can know what the name is, as well as if it's sensory, motor, or both, sensory and motor. Awesome. Spinal nerves. Uh, almost done here. There's several different pairs. I want to say there's 31 pairs of spinal nerves, all branching off of each vertebrae. Okay. It's just going to, uh, those are going to deal with different sensory and motor integration of different parts of the body. So like your neck is going to control your neck spinal nerves, like C1, C2 is going to control more things up here, whereas your thoracic is going to control more things here. All right. Makes sense. I'm not going to go through all that. Autonomic nervous system. Last thing, these are automatic responses. You cannot control them. And they're branched into two different divisions. The sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. Keep that in mind. All of them will do the opposite effect, usually, usually. So remember that they're gonna do the opposite effect. So for example, if you, okay, see a bear, right? You're about to die. You need to get your heart beating and you need to open up your eyes to see what's going on. You need to prime those muscles so you can run away. All of that will be initiated by the sympathetic division. But if the opposite is occurring, so say you're chilling at your house, enjoying a hot cup of coffee by a fireplace, calm environment, right? It's going to do the opposite. It's going to calm your heart down. It's going to unstimulate your skeletal muscles, uh, unstimulate or like just de-stress yourself essentially. Um, and your pupils won't get dilated because you don't have to see a bunch of things. It'll just relax and you'll be able to just focus on the book that you're reading. So it does the opposite effect on everything. One, raise your blood pressure, raise your heart rate. The other one, lower your blood pressure, lower your heart rate, calmed you down. Awesome. Now, a couple things to remember. Uh, sympathetic will originate in the thoracolumbar uh, region. So the T vertebrae and the L vertebrae, those spinal nerves. Whereas the parasympathetic will originate in the craniosacral region. So from basically the cranial, the cervical vertebrae, or uh, sorry, the cranial nerves, and then all the way down to your sacral region. So your sacrum, which is the lower tailbone, right? So uh, I'm not going to go through the details of that. But once again, all of these exert opposite effects. But what's interesting about these is if your parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated, okay, I'm saying calm down, rest, and digest. What's interesting is that when these neurons talk to your intestines, they will actually increase the activity. Okay, so if parasympathetic talks to your intestines, they will increase contractions, increase movement. Whereas the sympathetic division, if we go back to the sympathetic division, they will actually decrease they will decrease the uh, contractions in your uh, intestines. Why is that? Why is that? Well, if you're running from a bear, you don't care that you're digesting anything. You basically shut these guys down, right? So if these guys are the sympathetic, your sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, this guy will shut down because it doesn't matter that you're digesting right now. But if you're chilling, you want to digest. You want to absorb as much food as possible because you're calm. There's no danger, right? So it's kind of interesting how parasympathetic can calm some things, but stimulate other things. Same thing with the sympathetic. It'll stimulate some things like your heart and uh, your muscles, but calm down other things like your intestines, right? Awesome. Not going to go through the neurotransmitters for the autonomic nervous system. Hopefully this made sense. There's a lot of information with the nervous system. As you can see, I hope this was a good thing that you can take in a nutshell um, and use for your tests, use just for general understanding in class and elsewhere. So thank you for watching. Hopefully this was helpful.